Welcome to the podcast. Today's guest is Rob Hughes. Rob, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. That's okay. And obviously, thank you for uh, taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it because I know you're a very busy man. So thank you for that. Yes, it's crazy at the moment, isn't it? Even in times where uh, actually life isn't in in its normal state, it's still very, very busy at the moment. Yeah. I'm, uh, so what, how are you keeping busy, Rob? What's the typical day look like for you in lockdown? Uh, well, I'm, I'm trying to keep an element of normality, to be honest. So I get up first thing in the morning. I, I like to be up as early as I can. Uh, I said not crazy early, but I'm, I'm normally up and about from six. Uh, and then I like to go out and do a little bit of exercise uh, or alternatively get straight into um, work mode. So I'll be, I'll be either exercising or working uh, by seven o'clock. Mm. Then, um, you know, work isn't necessarily my normal work. Normal work could be filming, it could be editing, it could be out on the bank, it could be doing something. But of course, we're, we're very restricted in what we're doing. But there's a lot of paperwork, a lot of behind the scenes work to do. So it's something that's work related uh, through till about two o'clock, uh, just so I feel that I'm still doing something. And then uh, the afternoon mm -hmm. will be mine to potter. So yesterday the van got yet another clean uh, and it's had, uh, it's had a wax. <laughs> Um, before that, uh, you know, the, 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 I've done the same things as everyone else. You know, the shed is immaculate. Uh, the garage is tidy. Uh, even the boxes with all the crap in, in the garage have been looked through uh, and washed. So, you know, that, that sort of thing. So I think everybody's got a, a full rig box and immaculate uh, shed and garage. The lawn's been cut a couple of times. The cars are looking good. Uh, and then evening-wise, it's, it's family time. So uh, it'll be bike ride with, uh, with my lad. Uh, which is, you know, that's a set in stone thing because he has, he's back to school now. Uh, so, yeah, you know, same sort of thing really as, as, as families. But I have been spending an inordinate amount of time trying to watch satellites that just don't seem to appear. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you've tried yet, but um, Elon Musk and his star train, I think is as big a wind up as 5G. Uh, because <laughs> they, uh, there's there's a gang of us. There's probably half a dozen of us that they were at almost all the time. And, and if anybody's old enough to remember the Kit Kat Bander advert, it's almost yeah. like that with us, that we go out and try and look at it. And, you know, I, I have now seen some, but all you see is one satellite and then another one, you know, a few seconds later doing exactly the same thing. Now, I was, I was expecting the star train, as we call it, uh, mm -hmm. where there was a load of them together. And I've been desperate to see that because obviously there's only going to be a very short opportunity to see these things. Once they're all up there, you're not going to see them again yeah. uh, once they've spread out. So I just wanted to see it. And I've just spent ages trying to and failed miserably. I've blanked. I think what I should do is I should bait up for them, I think. <laughs> so, you know, just see if we can. Uh, lo location is, is obviously everything. So, yeah. I've seen anyway, so pictures, but that's about it. Yes, yeah, that's it. So I've, I've got a little bit caught in the um, in the in the in the Star Trek game. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, obviously, you've been keeping us all informed as much as you can. What's the latest on the lockdown fishing wise that you know of? <sighs> well, you know, this is this is the million dollar question everybody's asking me at the moment. When when can we get back to it? And there's a number of things that we've got to think about. You know, there's the, before we even go there, we've got to have the can and should argument or discussion mm -hmm. at least. Uh, and just because we can doesn't necessarily mean to say that we should. Mm -hmm. uh, and that goes for a lot of things. So, you know, make no mistake about it. The government make their decisions on advice that they receive. So let's have a look at how that decision making is made first. Ultimately, the person that will decide will be either Boris Johnson or more likely at the moment, Dominic Rob. Mm -hmm. They are the people that will make the ultimate decision because it is prime minister and deputy prime minister. Now, he doesn't just look out the window one day and think, oh, it's fantastic. Let's just let everybody go back fishing again. There are numerous things that he's got to think of. I appreciate that most people will know this anyway, but it's very useful to understand the decision-making process behind everything because that gives a little bit more clarity on how these decisions are made. So he will listen to his government advisors. Now, his government advisors are made up of a cabinet and one bloke is in charge of health, another is in charge of crime, another is in charge of sport, another is in charge of media, etc. And as they come further down the line, they will have advisors as well. Now, there's something called SAGE, which is the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies. And they are full of serious experts, both academics and practitioners, that put together what we often hear as referred to as models. So this model might say this and this model might say that. Now, they don't lick a finger, stick it in the air and see which way the wind's blowing. There is an awful lot of research that goes in 
to try and work out what might happen. So everybody sticks their opinion in and then they'll have a meeting. And the meeting you'll have heard uh, of COBRA meetings. Cabra, COBRA stands for Cabinet Office Briefing Room A, which is where uh, the briefing meetings happen for big emergencies. There are lots of these different rooms that go on uh, or that, that, that have meetings at various different levels. So everybody right down from the bottom end, such as us and the Angling Trust, will have input into that. And then that input will be taken up the line and will be dealt with at the next level, where eventually everybody will sit around and say, right, human beings are getting fed up with being locked in. Can we let them out yet? Medical officer, what's the risk if we do? So the medical officer says, well, the risk is they might catch something. So we look at how we can prevent that. And then you have to balance the damage that's caused by people staying in with the damage that might be caused with people going out. And again, I know this is quite a long-winded way to answer this question, but it's, it, it shows the level of thought that they have to go into. And what's happening at the moment is the Angling Trust are working with government to formulate practice guidelines, practical guidelines, and also working with various different agencies to try and bring a staged return to angling that will minimise everybody's risk of catching anything but at the same time, maximise everybody's risk of suffering things like mental health issues, which is a key problem at the moment. And, you know, mental health issues over the, over recent years have become really, really prominent. Going back a few years, when I was a little bit more involved in this sort of thing, uh, one of the government drives was to, uh, it, I suppose, improve people's health and reduce the burden on the national health service with um really health and fitness was the, the the key word at the time we want to get people healthy we want to get people fit now that's disappeared now and you'll hear health and well-being looked at because people look at the holistic side of things a lot more mm -hmm. so people's mental health is a, is a really really big issue and this is where fishing is absolutely perfect for that because if you speak to the majority of anglers and ask them why they go they say you know what we go to chill out relax and just get away from the stresses and strains of life. Now, mm -hmm. getting on a push bike and pedaling it around doesn't necessarily, it will give you that, but the key thing with that a lot of the time is the health and fitness element. So health and well-being, mental well-being is a massive, massive plus point of angling. So you then have to look at, well, actually, if that will assist people, how many will it assist? Because if it's only going to assist four, then actually it's not really worth doing. But if you look at how many people go fishing, then you see that a large proportion of the country at the moment will be helped with their mental well-being if they're allowed out to do something that they like doing. Now, if that thing that they like doing is very unlikely to cause any extra problems, then there's a good chance that it will be allowed. And the government are looking, of course, at trying to get us back to normality as quickly as possible. But again, you just can't open the door and say, right, crack on, go out and go fishing. So there's all sorts of things that we have to look at. One of the key things we have to look at is, you know, as soon as the doors are opened, is everybody going to make a bolt for Oxford and fill linear up? Mm. In which case, that's going to be a tricky one. So there's going to be travel restrictions in place. There's likely to be... Um, restrictions on how people fish and also there's got to be guidance because remember and this is this is something that fishing suffers all the time a lot of people don't understand fishing people that don't fish don't get it people that do fish do get it so if it's a case of all right fishing let's 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 open the door and let people go they might not realize that it could be a collective activity like match fishing where you have 120 people in a room doing a draw and if that's permitted that can cause a serious health problem hmm. equally People at the other end that say, no, we don't want anybody going out, don't realise that individually carp anglers will go sit in the middle of nowhere on their own and not see someone for a week. And mm -hmm. nobody will convince me, nobody, that fishing, particularly carp fishing, is not a brilliant way of self-isolating because we literally don't go anywhere. What are the risks? Well, risk number one, getting in a vehicle and going somewhere. You've got to fill up with fuel. Well, actually, that's permitted and you can do it anyway, so we're within government guidelines. And driving somewhere. Well, as long as we don't drive too far and we're pretty sensible about the way that we do it, there again isn't that much of a risk with, with going somewhere. People are allowed out at the moment. You know, we don't want that mass exodus, but actually driving is already a permitted activity. What we're not looking at is complicating already permitted activities. Uh, what we're looking at is trying to ease the burden a little bit. 
So, you know, there's loads and loads of reasons why we should, for example, go carp fishing and there's carp fishing and that's what we think and we think it's crazy, we can't go, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But remember the match anglers and the fact that there's got to be a lot of them in the same place doing a draw. The fact that they might sit five metres apart. What about carp anglers actually passing landing nets to each other and taking photographs? What about opening syndicate mm. gates? There's all of these things that have got to happen. And then, you know, let's let's flip that completely and look at something that a lot of carp anglers and match anglers don't look at, and let's look at sea fishing. Now, individually going down to the beach, brilliant. You know, you, you, you're in the middle of nowhere again. You're not going to be coming into contact with anybody. It should be pretty straightforward and sensible to do that. But then let's just have a look at humanity. And ultimately, and this is one of the things that I found from my live the other day, which, which I was quite surprised with. And I also saw... Uh, a report that the Angling Times put out about Christchurch Angling Club giving uh, frontline NHS workers free tickets. And they got loads of criticism because other people said, well, hang on a second, I do stuff, what's in it for me? And there seems to be uh, a, a very interesting slant on humanity that we're seeing at the moment, that there's a lot of, well, what's in it for me? Why aren't I getting something? And we need to look at that bigger picture at the moment because ultimately we're all going to either protect each other or hinder each other at some stage. So, you know, again, people wanting to push it a little bit, bloke going out, doing a little bit of beach fishing on his own, miles away from everyone, no problem. Let's have a look at the excuse hunters and the loophole gatherers and those people that think, oh, we're allowed down the beach now. Come on, family, bucket spades, two kids, dog, wife, in the car, driving 60 miles to Weymouth, mm -hmm. day on the beach. We've got one fishing rod in the car. The excuse is we're going fishing. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, fishing could cause a bigger problem than it will do if it's just what we class as normal fishing. So lots and lots of guidelines have got to be looked at. We have, you almost have to turn over every stone because remember, if it is allowed, if it goes wrong, it'll be banned very, very quickly once again. So we have to put together a, a, a plan and the Angling Trust are doing a really, really good job with this. We don't come into contact with the Angling Trust that much in the carp fishing world. And the majority of the time we hear about them because what they're doing is not enough about otters and they're do, not doing enough about poaching. Uh, and that's our general grumble. But actually, as a national governing body, what people have got to realise is that governments speak to officials, governments speak to experts, governments speak to other governments. The Angling Trust is our governing body that's who they're going to speak to. Now, we as carp angling have to have good representation within the angling trust. Uh, and, you know, I'm one of the consultants with that that puts carp fishing's views forwards. And also the, you know, the, the, the thought process, hopefully in a relatively sensible and balanced way, uh, that we can interact with other elements of fishing. Because if we just put our elbows up and try and get to the front of the queue and say, look, we're carp fishing, this is what we want we're not going to get anywhere. You have to be sensible and look at the slightly bigger picture mm -hmm. of everything. So, you know, a, a lot of information has been put before the trust. The trust have done a very, very good job of assimilating that information and putting it into a report, which is going before government ministers, which will be then hopefully approved or will come back for more information. It will then go further up the line and eventually it'll get to the end of the pipe where either Boris or Dominic will turn around and go, yay or nay. Mm -hmm. That's an awful long time to spend talking about when are we going to be able to get fishing again. But the long and short of it is that it's a massive process. And what everybody, yeah. again, has to remember is that if you're allowed to go out now, let's have a look at a risk assessment. Let's have a look at a very, very basic risk assessment. What's the best thing that can happen and the worst thing that can happen? And the best thing that can happen is you have a really nice day's fishing and you get out of the house and you think, oh, that was lovely. And the worst thing that can happen is you're dead. Hmm. And I'll pause there a little bit just to let that thought go in because this is why it's so serious and can't just be a case of let's go out there. Because if you go out and catch something as a result of going fishing, then that's a, a that's a fairly hefty thing. You know, it, and, and particularly if it's, you know, if you get something and pass it on to someone else and they get it and they die, you know, we're not talking about a small issue here. And I think one of the one of the things is that this Although this is a nationwide problem, there are there are bubbles and there are people living in bubbles that are at high risk and the stress levels that they will be undergoing at the moment are incredible and the conditions that they will have to be living through are immensely difficult. And then at the opposite end of the scale, there will be 
perhaps younger or fitter people that are living in rural areas that have a little bit more space where there isn't much coronavirus around at the moment. And, you know, we're, we're blessed down in the West Country that actually it's here, but it's not everywhere. You know, there are numbers, but they're not terrifyingly large numbers. Everybody's, of course, aware of what's going on. But I can imagine if you live in an urban area where it is prevalent and rife, mm. your living conditions are very difficult and very different to somebody that's living in a slightly rural, more relaxed area. So, you know, unfortunately, again, you know, we, we, we can only see the world through our own eyes. We can only live our own life. But it's up to authority and it's up to experts and it's up to, to all of the input that we give to put into this chain to try and get that big picture together so we can understand how it will affect everybody. Uh, so basically, that's what's happened. Mm-hmm. What's going to happen in the future? Well, at some stage, I, I, I know the trust are already working with government. Uh, at some stage, they will consider the report that is before government. And they'll come back and either say, it needs looking at or we you know we approve it or we disagree it uh then it will be passed further up the line now we know that these lockdowns tend to go in three week tranches so the next one the next review is may the 7th uh and what will happen then is they will either say things are going to stay the same alternatively we're going to relax a little bit or alternatively we're going to tighten up a bit so on may the 7th there will be more discussion now fishing might not even come on the radar because they might have other things to talk about and more other things that are or other things that are more important. In which case, you know what? We back down, we sit back and we wait our turn because an awful lot of this is about timing. Uh, you know, and if, if important people have got very important things to do and to think about, and we're banging on the door saying, can we go fishing? Can we go fishing? Can we go fishing? And then eventually they might turn around and say, you know what? We've had enough of you pestering us. And it's a little bit like the toddler pulling on the trouser leg saying, mum, can I have a biscuit? Can I have a biscuit? Can I have a biscuit? You know, what do you do with the child? Do you give it him? In which case he knows that he can pest you. Or alternatively, you just say, no, you've got to wait. And we're in exactly that situation as well. But I, I think what everybody hopefully will understand is that, you know, behind the scenes, there is an awful lot going on to try and get a, a, a staged return to angling that is satisfactory for everybody that won't cause any risk. And believe me, there's a lot of people spending a lot of hours doing this. And I'm, I'm going to face... I, I did a live uh, a week last Friday, which, um, mm. it, you know, it, it, it seemed to ruffle quite a few feathers. I, I'd just like to say this. Um, I, please remember that everything that we're doing, and if I'm bringing news to you, it's with the very, very best of intentions. Mm-hmm. If you don't know what's going on and you don't know what the future holds, it can breed uncertainty. When it brings uncertainty, that can, you know, it can it can affect people. I've had so many messages, more than anything else uh, that I've done before, other than the Team England World Championship stuff. But I've had so many messages uh, of thanks, just talking about people's mental health issues in particular how fishing isn't just and this is one of the things that i've tried to make clear uh with with my route up to to government that fishing isn't just fishing it's not just a sport to a lot of us it's our life it's our lifeline it's the thing that keeps us sane it's the thing that keeps us going it's something when you're an angler it's not necessarily like you're a footballer you know footballers go out they they're, they're obviously top end footballers It's their life completely. But a lot of other people might just go and have a kick around. But fishing isn't that for us. It's in our blood. And if it's in our blood, we are so engrossed in it that it is massively important to us. And as a result, when we lose it, it it, it has a dramatic effect on on, uh, our well-being. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and hopefully that is getting through. So, you know, for anybody that is critical about the fact that I'm bringing you news, you, you've, you've got an option of just not listening to it. I'm trying to help those people or bring news across as to what's going on and how it's happening. So that's what it is. And, and again, yeah. believe me, there's an awful lot of people working behind the scenes to try and make this happen. Nobody wants to put anybody in a position of risk because there is a question, should we go? Just because we can go, should we go? Uh, ultimately, everybody will have the option to make that own decision themselves if and when the lockdown is released and you know there have been signs that it's been released i don't want to give anybody any false hope and i'm certainly not going to say you know go fishing on monday but the, the the situation is that after the last lockdown they said we're going to keep things the same it could have got worse if everybody had gone out on that bank holiday weekend but they didn't so uh you know the 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 
straight afterwards they said that we're going to keep things the same but then what we're going to do is we're going to allow people to perhaps drive to exercise uh, you can drive now up to i think it's an hour as the guideline uh, in addition to that they said you can go out and exercise twice a day if you're sensible and you're following social distancing regulations there's talk about extra shops opening and work uh, and um you know the b and q is a prime example though once again i'm 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 amazed at how quickly people can flip these days that I put a post up uh, just to highlight the press report that was in the Telegraph the other day uh, about some of the comments that one of the minister made just about fishing and golf. And within five minutes, it turned into an argument about being cute. <laughs> Incredible. You know, we, 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 we perhaps need a little, um, take a little bit more time. To, to sit back we've got a lot of time at the moment uh, and i think that yes. might be part of the issue people have got a lot of time uh, so they get to do a lot of thinking but perhaps they should think a little bit more before they start arguing or shouting because ultimately you know we're all in this together we we it spread a bit of peace and love people mm -hmm. that's the no, definitely that's the and yeah absolutely and thank you so much for everything you're doing as well rob that's really appreciated and you're right there are so many moving parts to this and so many things that probably maybe some people aren't considering as well that it's it's a case of having to sort of step out and look at it from a neutral point of view isn't it so you can see absolutely. both sides yeah absolutely and and you know that re remember and this is something i've really really got to get across this we've, we've all seen some recent news on, across facebook and it seems to spread very quickly about some you know a fishery is going to open and there were two yesterday there was one three days ago um mm -hmm. it's the worst thing to do at the, at the moment you know every what angling's got to do is it's got to be seen to be part of the solution not part of the problem and mm -hmm. if it is part of the problem then it will be seen as a problem if it's seen as a problem we'll just get knocked back so anybody that's thinking about going fishing just hang fire for a bit you don't need to do it. You know, we'll be, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really hopeful that we will be back sooner rather than later. And the doom mongers out there will turn around and say, hang on a second. Uh, it, we're going to be locked down until Christmas. Uh, there's other people, you know, whenever you put a positive post up about anything, mm -hmm. there's a negative that comes back. And I, I appreciate and fully accept discussion because actually that's what we're all doing at all levels. You know, you have to have that discussion because you've got to look at pros and cons. Um, but the, the, the key thing is that if we're sensible and we, we to a degree, toe the party line, then actually there's there's more of a chance that we will be back to doing what we all love sooner mm -hmm. rather than later. But when we do, we've got to behave ourselves because if we don't behave ourselves, it can be taken away just as quick. Yeah. Absolutely. So if there are guidelines, and you imagine if, you know, the, the, the supermarkets, supermarkets are self-policing, there's loads of people that will turn around and go, oh, well, how are we going to do it? You know, 500 people could turn up at Linear. Actually, no, 500 people can't turn up at Linear because, one, Linear is sensible. So a little bit like 500 people turning up at Asda, they're not going to let them all in and go crack on, fellas. What they're going to do is they're going to put guidelines in place as to what you should and shouldn't do. And these are part of what the Anglin Trust are working on at the moment as well. Um, in addition to that, there will be a travel restriction because they're not going to turn around and say you can travel to exercise for an hour, but if you want to go fishing, you can crack on to Linear. Uh, and I use linear just as a prime example because, you know, it's central in the country. It gets loads and loads of people going there. I'm not singling it out for any other reason other than it gets a lot of travelling anglers. And mm -hmm. on just just on that point, and I'm, I'm sort of jumping the gun a little bit, but um, I've just written a, a piece for my one of my future huge news columns in the Angling Times. I have a, a little comment column in there. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is that, you know, when we do get back, and we don't know if it's going to be, an announcement on May the 7th or May the 10th or May the 21st or June the 6th or whenever it might be. But when you do get back, celebrate the fact that we're back. Don't celebrate the fact that there's things that we can't do. Celebrate the fact that there's things that we can do and actually have a little look closer to home because there are so many gems of fisheries that are actually quite close to home. You drive past on the way to other places. You know, we don't all necessarily need to rush to the same place and think of it like a lake. You know, everybody wants to get on a point because you think it's the best peg. Mm -hmm. Um, but sometimes having a look in the quiet corner that nobody's looking in, you can find some real surprises. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. you know, we've got a lot of fishing out there to be had. And sometimes we, we ignore some of the things that are really, really close to us. Yeah, good point. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Rob. Okay, right. Serious that's stuff lot. over. That's it now. Yeah, that's that's lockdown done. Thank you, mate. That's a really good answer. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, so obviously you mentioned Team England briefly. Why don't we have a little yes. chat about that? Yeah, well... We <laughs> 
Oh, excuse me, choke on my coffee. We're a little bit up in the air with everything at the moment because, you know, COVID is is not just affecting um, us in the UK, but obviously it's affecting everybody around the world. So as a result, mass Mm -hmm. movement uh, around the world is going to be difficult. So flights are grounded. We've already lost the Ladies World Championships this year, which we are, we're gutted about, but we understand at the same time. Um, I'll start with our ladies. Ladies first, obviously. The ladies team, uh set up three years ago it's been really really well received we've got loads more girls now fishing uh whether it's coming along to fishing competition with us uh or coming to the uh, carp academy set up by um, bev and andy uh or whether it's simply just getting out on the bank which is absolutely fantastic for our sport you know it's it's this is another thing why fishing is so good because it is all inclusive and it's accessible to everybody so uh, you know, unfortunately, we well, we've got we've got Team England, we've got Team England ladies. We fished in the World Cup last year. Uh, this year uh, was going to be the first ever ch- World Championships. I, I, I managed to work with Phipps to get ladies uh, competition fishing into the international calendar. It was accepted and ratified last year. We bid for the um, uh, the, the honour of hosting the first ever ladies World Championships. We got it. Uh, it was due to take place in September, and unfortunately, the competition calendar has virtually been cancelled. So, mm-hmm. sadly, we've lost that. So, it's going to roll over to 2021. The men's is under review at the moment because we're at the end of September and we're expecting a decision. What they do is they have a, a, exactly the same as we in England have a three week review with government. FIPS are having a four week one, and if it carries on, then they'll cancel the end of September. So, we know that the beginning of September has now been cancelled. Mm-hmm. We're expecting. Um, september's men's event to be cancelled too so it'll be a great shame because it means that you know we've we've lost the key international events but we will have the home nations uh scotland are setting a ladies team up wales have got one england have got one scotland wales and england have got men's teams come on ireland the the invite is there you know it's there come on ireland irish carp anglers get yourself a men's team together speak to the national course fishing federation over in ireland come and join the party. So Mm -hmm. we'd love to see Ireland over as well so we can have a true home nations event. But, you know, the the, the good thing about that is that we've got a lot more flexibility because travel restrictions hopefully will be a bit better towards the back end of the year. And if we have to fish and have a competition in October, you know what, we'll we'll do it then. No no Mm -hmm. problem. Uh, So that's it. Um, Yeah, there's competition calendars being being decimated really, you know, with with sport. But my my main role is working with... um, or one of my main roles, should I say, is 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 working with BT Sport, and of course, mm-hmm. you know, both BT and Sky have been absolutely crucified at the moment. There is there is no sport happening anywhere. Yeah, uh, yeah. you know, whether that's fishing, football, or whatever. Yeah. So yeah, the sporting calendar has been been very disrupted. So we'll just we'll just regroup. Yeah, it's incredible, that's isn't it. it? How it's affected everything. It's just something that you. Uh, I mean, I've said it so many times. You, there's just nobody could have seen it coming, could they? The way it's had an impact on everything no no that's right and but, you, you know the, the for every i'm, I'm the eternal optimist i always mm-hmm. look on the uh, opportunist side of things or optimistic side of things should i say um and also i'm a, a, a little bit of a serial entrepreneur so i'm always looking for opportunities mm-hmm. um and if you look at the the opportunity at the moment the world has an opportunity so yes it's terrible we're not traveling but you know what it might help global warming pollution mm-hmm. unquestionably down yeah you know when, when you look yeah. at there are serious negatives but of course there's always a positive as well and i look at the positives that actually nature's just having this opportunity to regroup and mm-hmm. i'm 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 in a, a a strange place at the moment with a close season because i argued and argued and argued that we should get rid of the close season on rivers that mm-hmm. we should be able to go out and fish on rivers but actually the fact that there is no close season on lakes and canals doesn't really make any difference. But actually, if you look at what's happening recently with the fact that there is a close season, there is a punctuation, mm. for a start, everything gets a little bit of a rest, including us. Mm-hmm. But but secondly, a punctuation is always a really, really good thing to do because it gives the opportunity of stopping, taking stock, thinking, preparing and restarting. Mm-hmm. And whether you do that with work, i.e. you get home at the end of the day and go back at the end of the, uh, the, the following day, or whether, you know, it, just remember when we're all on a session, you're out, f- holiday in France, prime example. You're out there, you're on a week-long session, you're blank for a couple of days, things are a little bit tough, you don't really know what to do, 
you're losing your head a little bit because you wanted to catch. Your mate scores a couple already and you're, you're struggling a little bit um, and you're keeping going, you're keeping going, you're keeping going. And you just don't really know what to do and you almost stagnate. So you think, oh, stuff it. I'll, I'll nip down the shops and go and have a shower. So you nip down the shops, have a shower, you punctuate that moment. While you're away, you've stopped, you've taken stock, you've thought, you've regrouped, you've come back, you start again. And you start again with so much more vigour. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I think these 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 punctuations are actually really, really good for us. Really good. Yeah, and so gives, I'm almost gives you. Go on. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm almost changing my mind now and thinking actually we should all have a close season now, whether or not it's a close season in the close season, because I don't necessarily think the close season regulations for the purposes of the arguments that are put forward now are relevant as much. Mm. Um, but actually, you know, it might be the season runs for eleven months, whatever it might be, and each fishery manager has the opportunity to shut for a month. Mm-hmm. And no, it just is a really good point. It, it's 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 just it's the psychology of it because it makes you feel better. Yeah, and there's that act of gratitude. I was going to say <clears> as well. You think how many more people are going to be so grateful for all the simple things that we would almost take for granted, fishing, going out, everything else that's suddenly been taken away. Well, I think you know uh, the reset it, works. Yes, it, it, it'll be really interesting to see how people do get back to open inverted commas normality because actually we mm-hmm. don't know what normality is going to be like normality in the future isn't necessarily going to be the normality that we had before um i for one are going to change my working practice mm-hmm. and i um I, I i always work i'm i'm classed by my family as a worker like a lot of people say look you work too much you work too hard you work too long uh whatever it might be and, and I, I do it because i love it because i don't necessarily yeah. see it as work it is yeah. it, you know it's it's uh, to use a word or a phrase I used earlier, it's part of my fabric anyway. That's what I'm like. Mm-hmm. Uh, but actually, this this enforced change has opened my eyes actually to the fact that slowing down a little bit makes you enjoy what you're doing more. Uh, mm-hmm. Because sometimes, despite the fact that I've got the best job in the world, I don't necessarily enjoy it because I'm rushing to get through it to get the next thing done. Uh, yeah. and, and slowing down and enjoying it is... Uh, is, is is definitely a, a, a plus point, and um, for, you know the, one of the positives I'll take about it, a, a, away from this is it's made me significantly more aware of things around me, rather than mm-hmm. the tunnel visioned, driven, got to get this done because there's yeah, this and things off in an do. order. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, uh, yes, yeah, it, we, you know how good is being on the bank going to be. Mm-hmm. How just how good is that going to be? You know, when we're allowed out and we've got the rods out, how exciting is it going to be? <laughs> getting everything ready. How nervy are we going to be? Shoving everything in the car, making sure that we've got everything. How incredible is it going to be? <laughs> getting in the car, stereo on, driving down the lake. Yeah, and there's that setting element of up. unknown, uh, unknown yes. of the fish weight. <laughs> exactly and then you know and getting them out there again getting it wrong because we were a little bit out of practice chucking the first pva <laughs> bag up the tree on the margins thinking bollocks you know and then and then getting the rods out sitting back and go you know what i'm here huh. that that that's just a winner for me oh, an absolute winner mm. oh i'm getting all excited yeah me too that's why i just paused mm. i was just imagining it yeah yeah, yeah waking I'm, I'm up that it, first I? morning yeah and yes looking out the mist clearing off the water. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Lovely. Yeah. So, cool. Just all right. Uh, yeah. Right. Well, yeah. What next? Yeah. Okay. Let's, um, <clears throat> have you got a memorable capture you can share with us, Rob? Oh God. I've got one that maybe loops. sticks. It doesn't have to obviously be the biggest fish. It can just be one that's sort of maybe ingrained in your mind. I've got, I've got so many memorable captures. You know, we we all have that, and there are there's reasons why they're memorable. You know, whether it's your know, your first double or your first mm-hmm. twenty or a good and off the top or, or things. There's always so many memorable captures, um, and you know, I've I've been lucky enough to catch some very very big fish. I've had I've had seventy pound mirrors. I've had seventy pound commons. People always talk about um, you know, what's your PB, and and to me, the PB is one of the ones that means the most to me. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm going to give you two examples of PBs now, and it's more mm-hmm. to do with where I was and who I was with mm-hmm. than necessarily the fish or the size of it. And I, I'm, I, I'm going to have to give you two because they're the first two that jumped into my mind from both sides of my brain at the same time. Um, I love Cassian. I've had a Cassian love affair for, well, since 1986. 
Uh, I first went out there in 1996, uh, but I first went to France in 1988. And the reason I went to France in 1988 was because as a young carp tiger, uh, aged 16, Rod Hutchinson caught some enormous fish from Cassian, and there was a picture of him with a carp that was, I think, 58 pounds, and it was on a lilo. And you might remember the picture. And that grabbed me by the scruff of the neck and just changed my world. It was a little bit like finding God. I think mm. if you were a born-again Christian, I think that's what happened with me then. I saw that and just thought, I'm having a bit of that. Now, I was 16 and couldn't drive, but I thought, as soon as I get a car, I'm going there. So when I was 17, I took my test, and it was a while before I got my car. And then I got my car and thought, right, I'm going there. And I looked on a map because I didn't know where it was, and I looked on a map and realised how far away it was. And... uh, and thought, blimey, I can't go there. Uh, but I did end up going to France, and it, it, it just started off for me a, a whole world of international fishing. You know, I love carp fishing at home, and, and this is late 80s, early 90s, so it was in its infancy over here then, but it was real pioneering stuff in France then. Um, so eventually when I went to Cassian, uh, and the, the first trip was in 96, it was just a magical place for me, and I, I went with Crowey. Uh, we caught an awful lot of fish on our first trip. We only did five days. I think we had 20-something fish, which, you know, was a, a brilliant result. We were day ticket whippersnappers then, so rather than sitting up and, and waiting, we'd move around all over the place. Um, yeah. Never caught a really big one. And I watched the fish in Cassian and, and the sizes of them and how, how nice they were. And there was one fish in there that was called Bernadette. Now, Bernadette was at that time in the mid-2000s, biggest fish in the lake, but also the carp, the international carp angling equivalent of either Mary or the Black Mirror or, mm. you know, the, 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 the Colmere fish, uh, mm. whatever whatever pedestal you want to put it on, on an international scale, Bernadette was the one. And uh, I, I just looked at this fish. You know, it was, it was almost one of these ones, even though I knew Cassie quite well and I caught a few fish and I've fished it a few times, it was one of those ones that was never on the target list. It was just on the admiration list. I was fishing there and I knew it lived there. Um, and I went on family holiday there when my son was born, just before wife went back after maternity leave. And we went for two weeks uh, and I used to fish. I was a, a, not allowed to fish, but I permitted myself to fish two evenings a week. And I'd go for three hours in the evening. And the first week I decided not to fish. I was just going to watch and see where people were. And, you know, people always want to go to third points on the North Arm and they want to go to Gerard's or they want to do, you know, go to all of the normal areas because a lot of travellers there go to the key main known spots. And I was looking at it. One thing I've learned from from Cassian over the years is that they actually, they like to be where people aren't. And as soon as they start getting fished for, they generally tend to move. So every time I'd go near Cassian, um, I'd, I'd go and have a little look at where people were. And then the second week I started baiting up. And there was one area for two weeks that nobody went into. And I went down there and decided, right, I'm going to have a little go there. Uh, and it was a margin spot that nobody really was interested in, but I'd, I'd shoved a load of bait in, uh, kept going on it, and lo and behold, I had a bite, and it was a, just a frightening take. It absolutely rattled off. It was a terrifying fight. I had to get in the boat to go out. It got caught around some snags. You know, it was, that, and I knew it was a good fish. And uh, it just, it, one minute it's stuck, and there's stumps on the bottom, and it's caught around a rock, then it's gone in some weed. It's done all sorts of things. Uh, and eventually it's come up to the surface. I've netted it and it was 63 pounds, 12 ounces and it was Bernadette. <laughs> and, it, you know, it was, that was it. So I fished that trip for, ooh, I, I don't know how long into the session that I caught it, but it was probably, it was, you know, it was a lot, slightly longer evening. So I, I probably caught it four hours, did four hour trip. Caught it. Just, wow. <laughs> just phenomenal. And, and that was it then, didn't fish again. Yeah. So, you know, that we'll go on holiday down there. I'll be able to do loads of fishing and didn't just spend so much time prepping it up. And, and to see that fish go over the net cord was amazing. And, you know, I've caught bigger fish. Uh, mm. I've, I've caught much bigger fish. I've caught certainly nicer looking fish, but yeah, that was Bernadette. And that was, mm. that, that for me was just incredible. Um, and then just to, to flip it, the opposite end of the scale, uh, growing up, reading about Red Mire, uh, reading about, um, again, you know, Dick Walker and the old boys in the early days, but for me, once again, Rod was God. 
uh, I'm reading about Rod with uh, the particle approach on there. And, you know, I've got an enormous amount of respect for Kev Clifford. Uh, I'm, I'm reading his stories. And, and you know, I, I think Dick Walker and sort of in slightly more modern times, Chris Yates, a, 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 a iconic with uh, Red Meyer. Mm. Actually, Rod Hutchinson and Kev Clifford equally were, were two phenomenal anglers down there. And uh, I, I, you know, I, I grew up with those as, as as a couple of my heroes, and of course Chris as well. But uh, uh, eventually, managed to get on there. And, and Simon Crow, uh, obviously very very good mate of mine, uh, he he had a week booked on there. He he, he decided one year that I've, I've got to get a week on it. And the Cup Society used to auction off the first week, and he bid a ridiculous mm-hmm. amount of money at the time. I think he paid fifteen hundred quid for a week. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, which which going back ten, twelve, fifteen years was an awful lot of money then. Uh, but even yeah. stuff it, you know, I've I've been working hard, I've been saving, I've been saving, I've always wanted to do it. I'm, I'm going to do it. Mm-hmm. So uh, he went. And he said, if you want to come down, then you can come. You can have a a, a, a day and a night with me if you want. Uh, pick which one you want to do. And um, uh, the only thing is, you've got to keep out of. I think it's the Willows pitch, isn't it? And Keffords that uh, that Dick Walker caught his record fish from. So he said, I'm, I'm fishing there. Can't come anywhere near me. That's my bit. You can go anywhere else. And I went, well, that's fantastic because the only place I would ever want to sit is in the shallows where Chris Yates caught the pilgrim. Hmm. And, uh, you know, to, to, to go up there would just be absolutely fantastic. So we went, yeah, come down. Anyway, um, the closed season regulations had changed. So it opened, it was the Saturday before June the 16th. So I said, well, I'll, I'll come down on, on June the 16th, if that's all right, because that would be magical. So I was sat in the shallows of Redmire on June the 16th. Uh, you know, I, I can't remember what year it was. I'll have to look back at what year it was. But, you know, hmm. 30 years, maybe 30, 35 years to the day that Chris Yates was up there doing the very same thing. <laughs> and... I was just hoping and hoping and hoping to catch one. I didn't get down until lunchtime, so it wasn't 15th and start on the 16th. But by the time I got down and seen Crowey and done what I needed to do, uh, I, I, and I was, I got a PVA bag out and it was just dropping dark. And I thought, God, I, I'd, I'd love to catch one today. I'd love to catch one, but to, to catch one June the 16th would just be amazing. Anyway, quarter to midnight, it rattled off. And when I went up there, there was the red colour of the water. There was, you know, there was the weed. There was the, the smoke screaming that it used to do, uh, mm. all, all the fish up there. And it was just iconic red mire. And this thing absolutely belted off. And I got my two and a quarter pound soft action rods. And, you know, I'd red mired down as opposed to Cassian up, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Everything yeah, was yeah. small and light. Uh, mm. Anyway, it's gone off and it's smashed. It's, it's clearly on. It's gone into this weed bed. And uh, anyway, it, it, I, I thought I'd lost it. And I'm just reeling in this enormous ball of weed. My heart is in my mouth. I'm feeling sick. I can't feel anything at all. I've netted a big ball of weed. It's now dark. I've got the torch and I'm pulling the weed apart. And eventually in the bottom of the net, there was a flash of gold. And it was just uh, incredible to see that. And I'm keeping digging the weed out. And there's more and more weed coming out. And there's hardly any fish in there. It's like it, it's it must be in there somewhere, and I've got that at the bottom, and it was four pound fifteen ounces. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It was yeah. it was a red Meyer carp. Yeah. It was a common, and it was on June the sixteenth. Wow! And it was just, and it still makes me smile now. Still makes yeah. me smile. So Amazing. you know that's that's the most iconic carp in the whole world, mm-hmm. and arguably a, a completely insignificant one yeah but it's but it's not about the, the carp is yeah that's it and that's what fishing is isn't it it's not the fish mm-hmm. if you're yeah. doing it just for the fish i think you're doing it for the wrong reasons because you know we all go on a journey when when you start your angling journey you want to catch a fish mm-hmm. and then when you've caught one you want to catch another one and then when you've caught another one you want to catch lots of them and then when you've caught lots of them you probably want to compete with your mates so to, to prove that you can catch lots more than they can Oh, and then you want to catch a bigger one and then you want to catch the mm. biggest one and then you want to catch another big one that's bigger than the biggest one that you've caught already mm. and then I think that eventually when you do that what happens is you go full circle and almost your the first lap of your journey is complete it's not your journey that's complete but the first lap of your journey is complete because then what you do is is 
you become very comfortable in your fishing. And I'm immensely comfortable in my angling now. Uh, mm. You know, I, I, I don't feel like I need to prove anything to, to anybody. Yeah. I don't even want to prove anything to anybody because actually my angling journey is now for me, it's not for anyone else. When you're young and trying to muscle your way up or, you know, compete with other people on syndicates or, or for fish or whatever, it's a different situation. But now I'm, I'm as happy uh, going out on a big reservoir on the continent fishing for 70 pounders. I think I'm going for an evening session down to my local lake, which is sheer water, catching doubles off the top. Yeah. And the, the key thing for me is the occasion now. And also yeah. in particular, who you're doing it with, because mm-hmm. sharing the experience is such an amazing thing, you know, and, mm-hmm. and you don't necessarily have to be a social angler. You know, some of the best anglers are really, really anti-social anglers and the journey is theirs. But yeah. the moment of the capture after, after is when they're sharing. Yeah. So sometimes you share the whole experience, sometimes you share a part of it. But without sharing it, I don't think you're completing the full part of the picture because, mm-hmm. you know, the, 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 there's, there's so much to be had from our sport, so, so much. Yeah, I completely agree. And sharing that moment, even it doesn't have to be you that catches. If you're part of somebody else's capture, exactly. it, it just it's it rubs off on you, doesn't it? You can feel it. You, you're almost as excited as they are. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Helping with the yeah. weighing, getting the, getting the snaps done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, my about. my lad Jack is he's thirteen now, and he, he you know he loves his fishing. Uh, but I've I've almost done it a little bit old school that he started fishing when he was very young. You know, his first mm-hmm. stuck pole in his hand at four. Um, we then, you know, he used to come and do little bits and bobs at seven. We started his what I class as his his angling training. So we used to yeah. go on a Wednesday night for an hour after school down the local mm-hmm. village pond and catch whatever was coming along. So to begin with, he'd catch them. Then he'd learn about float shotting. Then he'd learn about accuracy of getting the maggots around the float. Then he'd learn about how often you have to feed to be able to get more fish. Mm-hmm. Then he'd learn about how you fish differently to catch different fish. And then it was stick float fishing and then various different things. And it was only it was only two years ago that um, he, he actually started carp fishing. So it was 12 when he started carp fishing. Bearing in mind, he's been fishing for five years. He's, all he could ever do before was net the fish for me, but I'd send him to try and find them. We'd talk about how we would try and catch them mm. because I didn't want him to catch a big carp when he was really young because mm. once you've caught a big carp, it sort of blows your mind for everything else a little bit. Yeah. And and so I wanted that that journey to be a, a, a quite a wholesome journey for him. And and now we do go carp fishing. So, you know, he's really enjoying his surface fishing. That was something we got into last year. Uh, but I think if I was to ask him what his favourite was, it would be it would be predator fishing uh, mm. and, and drop shot fishing, for, for particularly for wrasse. You know, we go down to Portland quite a bit. I'm lucky that about an hour and a half away from me, we've got some really nice coastline. So we go down to Portland uh, and we fish for wrasse off the rocks there and they're just such good fun. Uh, he loves his pike. Uh, he quite mm-hmm. likes his perch, um, mm-hmm. and and certainly in the summer, you know, it's a, it's a great thing to do. But um, you know, enjoying enjoying spending time with him, but also enjoying his journey as well. It's almost as rewarding as me enjoying my journey. Yeah, and I, you yeah. know, I'd urge anybody that that wants to get their kids into fishing. One of the key things that you've got to do. People say, "Oh, well, take them fishing." Taking them fishing isn't necessarily good enough because what you tend to do is you fish and they watch and then they'll get bored um and if you're going to teach them fishing the best thing to do is not fish with them let them fish Mm -hmm. and certainly i know when i was going through the the stick float process with with jack he watched me do it catch a few then it'd be like right it's your go three trots Mm -hmm. for you see what you can do then my go three trots Mm -hmm. for me then you'll go passing it back into help so much but you know so often we we either just do all the fishing or alternatively mm-hmm. we stick them on one side with the rod to make their own mistakes and then we do our own thing so we're not mm-hmm. really taking them fishing they're just coming at the same time with us and being being dumped in one place so they can crack on and yeah. you know they're good they'll amuse themselves anyway but uh I, I i think he you know he quite enjoys it i hope so i hope no, so because I, I i know that from my point of view if if you said to me if you could go fishing tomorrow where would you go i'd go out with him somewhere Mm-hmm. brilliant yeah that's really nice um where do you like we'll we move on i'm sort of uh, very mindful of the time we're approaching an hour where oh, do really you 
Um, it's a question. So we're doing like a rotary, rotary style question. Um, your question from, I think it's Mike Holly from yesterday is, okay. um, where do you see carp fishing in 20 years time? Oh, blimey. I was asked this question 20 years ago. <laughs> I mean, uh, Gordon Bennett, I've been around that long because that would be what? Yeah, that would be 2000. We were asked that question a lot because it was the yeah. turn of the millennium. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, well, look, there are doom and gloomers that say, well, it can't carry on. And you know what? 20 years ago, that's what they said. Mm-hmm. 20 years ago, oh, we will never carry on like this. You know, I, I, I was... I was lucky enough to to come into carp fishing at, at such an incredible time. And if, if I could choose a time to have lived in my carp fishing career, it would be exactly when I did. It would have been exciting in the early walker years. It would have been good, um, you know, in the, in the, in the Yates years, but actually the boom started, I would say late eighties through to mid nineties. And then it's, it leveled and then it started again with, you know, with, with the, the, the media traffic that was created. Uh, and I, I don't necessarily think, it will slow down. I think, you know, if you, if you look at every element of carp fishing, it's growing. Mm. The downside of that is obviously lakes are getting busier and fishing is changing. So <sighs> carp fishing will still be here. It will be here stronger than ever. Um, it's bucking the trend and it has bucked the trend now for the thick end of 50 years. Mm. So, you know, it, it, it will, I, I, I think things are cyclical. Yeah. Life is cyclical. Everything is cyclical. You know, some of the rigs that are being invented now are actually just slightly different rigs that were reinvented ages ago. And um, I, I, I have a little smile to myself when I look at all of the pioneering anglers that are now going over and discovering uh, some of the fantastic European fishing that's available. Um, and these mm. these people, not, I'm not going to name any individuals because I'm not singling out any individual, but a, 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 not 15 years ago, People of that ilk were turning around saying, well, foreign fishing didn't count. It was all about England and English fishing is best and everything overseas is rubbish because they're easy or they don't count or, you know, all of that pathetic argument that used to be real, um, raised out. And, you know, we I, I used to run a holiday company uh, and, and one of our slogans with the holiday company, and it wasn't to one particular venue. We used to run all over the world. Uh, it was Angling International. And um, one of our slogans was, it's a big world, come and enjoy it with us. And, you know, Crowe and I, we, we've been very lucky enough to be at the, at the forefront of some fantastic international travel. You know, we, we, we fished in South Africa in 99 mm. uh, before carp fishing was a thing over there. There was an expat over there who, who found some really nice fish and said, why don't you come over and have a go? Um, and now look at it. You know, it's it's mm. the, one of the biggest forms of, of fishing over there. Romania is a prime example. Romania are an immensely strong competitive nation in the in the world championships. They've, they're ranked number one in the world. Oh, no, they're two now. France are number one. Um, but they were ranked number one in the world for a long time. They've won numerous world championships. Um, going over to Reduta back in 99. Uh, again, mm. another time. Carp fishing didn't exist over there. You know, it's only 20 years old in some of these countries. So... There is a massive, massive, massive amount of fishing available. It's just got to be discovered. And, and what you'll find is that, again, things are things are cyclical. So day tickets are trendy. Day tickets aren't trendy anymore. Syndicates are trendy. Uh, syndicates aren't trendy. Going overseas is trendy. So people go overseas. And then actually, because loads of people go overseas, what they'll do is they'll, they'll go back to syndicates again or they'll go back to day tickets again. Yeah. But what you'll find is that when the circle gets back around to the top and starts again, it's better the second time. Mm-hmm. or different improved mm-hmm. might be better than, than than better because day tickets 20 years ago aren't anywhere near what they are now and you know if you I, I, forgive me i don't know how long you've been carp fishing but um crowy and i started writing for carp world in 93 mm-hmm. and we started writing a series called day ticket waters and what that was at the time was a review of fisheries to go to where you could have open access fishing because back then the majority were club lakes Club mm-hmm. lakes were run by match anglers. There weren't necessarily that many carp in them, and there were all sorts of, um, you know, difficult positions. And if mm-hmm. you if you wanted to go off and have a go somewhere else, where could you go? And we started this series, and there might have been a dozen places in the country that you could have gone back then. You know, there was a few key waters like uh, Waveney was open access, Broadlands was open mm-hmm. access, Farlow, Sapphire Lakes. You know, there was a few places, but there weren't many. And I remember thinking at the time i don't know how long this is going to be able to run because i don't know if there's enough waters and look at it now yeah 
you know, look how look how many open access data kit water there are now. There are yeah. literally loads and loads and loads and loads. With the size um, of the fish as well. <laughs> the size of the fish is incredible, and and to a degree they'll keep going. You know, the, mm-hmm. are we going to see a hundred pound fish in the UK? I don't know. Not not convinced immediately, but you know, in twenty years' time, it could be it could well be the case. Mm-hmm. Um, are we going to see a hundred and fifty pound fish overseas? What a ridiculous thing that is to say. 150 pound carp who on earth would say anything like that and yet you know marcel rouvier's fish from the river yon at 78 pound that was the record for years and years and years and years until the reduta fish broke it in 1999 Mm. you know that was unheard of and an 80 pounder well the first 80 pounder wasn't caught that long ago from rainbow was it and then the first 100 pounder when that was caught from source and then the one from Uruaqua, and then suddenly we're looking that in a period of what? How long? Uruaqua has been going about fifteen to twenty years, but actually it's been in the public domain probably the last six or seven years. Mm. If you look at that, you know, an eighty pounder was a big fish over there, and there was a chance of a ninety, but those fish are now doing one hundred and fifteen pounds. <laughs> so whether you like it or not. Yeah, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, but that's what they're doing. And if they're doing that, they're they're capable, carp are capable of growing there. Because, you know, if you look at a giraffe or an elephant, they're big creatures, but they've got a limit to what they grow to. Mm -hmm. We don't know what the limit for a carp is because it hasn't got there yet. Mm -hmm. Because what we've seen is the biggest carp is 70 pounds. No, it's 80. No, it's 90. No, it's 100. No, it's 110. No, it's 116. So, you know, a, a 116 pound is the current biggest carp in the world, but is it the limit for carp? And the answer, I think, is no. So there's a pondering thought, isn't it? How yeah. big is the biggest carp going to be in the world in 20 years' time? Wow. Yeah. Is it going to be 150? And if you do, remember the first lunatic that ever suggested 150 pound <laughs> carp was here yeah. on this thing. 150 pound carp. Crazy. Yeah, well, this is... This, this should still be accessible in 20 years' time, so wouldn't that be nice to point people back? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Um, have you got a question we can ask our next guest, Rob? Um, uh, well, yeah, let's, let's, have a, let's have a look at some of the things that we've spoken about um, already. I, I, I think accessibility for, um, for, for, for fisheries is, uh, is, is one thing, and the busyness, I think, of, of fisheries is another. I grew up as an old school angler, where watercraft is vitally important. So, Mm -hmm. you know, location was the key and knowing where that carp is going to be and what it's likely to do and how it's likely to feed. Now, if you look at linear, again, as a prime example, a lot of the time it's really busy. You can't choose where you want to go. Bluebell, another one. Lots of these commercial venues, lots of syndicates lakes now. Watercraft actually it's very difficult for us to practice because you don't get the opportunity. Mm-hmm. And also, carp now are conditioned by people. You know, they're a very domesticatable creature, carp, because you can train them really, really quickly. Trout you can't train as quickly, but carp you can train very quickly. Stick some feed mm-hmm. in the corner, you know what, it's going to keep coming back there. So I think watercraft is significantly less important than it used to be. I think rigs and bait application now are becoming more important. And I think we're seeing a rollover in, you know, what's at the top of the list? What should people do first? So, you know, let's, let, let me just pose that thought uh, to whoever's on next. What yeah. do they think about the change in the way that carp are conditioned, carp behaviour uh, and where do rigs and baits now sit in comparison with watercraft? Yeah, I'm writing that down as you speak. Uh, one other point I'd like to cover as well. Um, we sort of mentioned briefly off mic the other day about um, some of your underwater stuff. Yes, yes. Just, which is very quickly, so say I'm mindful of your time. Um, That's right, you, you mentioned me about time. about colours um, underwater. Yes. Can you um, talk a bit about that? Yeah, well, look, the underwater world's fascinated me for years and years and years. I've, I've, I became, I've, I've always liked snorkeling in the sea. I've always liked looking at stuff, but I became uh, a diver and an underwater photographer, not so I could go out and take pretty pictures of coloured things in coral reefs, but because I, I just want to scratch around in muddy lakes in the UK and try and understand what the bottom's like a little bit more. And 
I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm very much of the opinion that you know bog standard rules of battle. If you know your enemy, then you've got a better chance of defeating them. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to know more about the carp and its environment. Always been inquisitive about that, and you know anybody that's been out in a boat and looked over the edge will will have seen a different world to one that they see from the bank. And anybody that's stuck an underwater viewer in and 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 had a look from a boat down below with more clarity will see it again. Well, imagine what it's like when you're down there with a face mask, snorkel, and ideally air tanks on. You can mm. you can see so much. So going through the journey on that, the first thing you look at is is the environment. Wow, there's a bit of weed there, or there's this, or there's that, and then there's, there's, there's the other. Then we go on to rigs. Uh, and our presentation and, and see you know how things look and how we can improve that. Uh, then you move on to fish. Uh, hopefully you'll see fish and you look at how they behave. And one of the key things for me at the moment is uh, the psychology of carp as well. I love looking at psychology uh, because fish behave in very different ways to each other. You know, they've all got their individual characters in exactly the same way that, uh, uh, that animals have as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's interesting to, to, to look at that. But I've become really really interested in color because things change you know if you look out the window now uh, it might be bright it might be cloudy and if you look out in another six hours it might be a different color again because the light is either brighter or darker and tonight it's going to get dark uh, and there won't be any light around uh, tomorrow morning it'll get light again but we don't know if it's going to be bright and dark and it's exactly the same underwater it's a permanently changing thing it's not the same you know we we see or we have this opinion oh this is it because this is it actually it's not it changes it's natural so you need to change with it to make the most of it and one of the key things that i've found that helps is is using color particularly in clear water as a as an attractor Uh, and if you've watched any of the fantastic calder underwater footage you'll see uh, irrefutable evidence of fish singling out certain things whether it's because of smell or whether it's because of color uh, i don't know but they can certainly see because they hone in on things straight away. Uh, and I've, I've actually had some very interesting discussions and even arguments with people about fish and whether they can see in colour. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I think there was a bit with Simon Scott saying, oh, they see differently to us and they, they don't see the same colours. And um, Chile just doesn't agree that colour matters in any way, shape or form. And, I, you know, I'm not criticising these people. I'm singling them out because they've made comments uh, in the same way that I'm making comments, but mm-hmm. there's there's nothing that will um, that convince me that in clear water fish can't see well. They've got good eyes and they can see well. In addition to that, carp in particular, I think, can see in the, our normal colour spectrum, but they can also see just into infrared and just into um, ultraviolet. They've actually got polarising filters over their eyes, which means they can pick out things in gloom very easily. And if you go underwater and you look laterally, it's a little bit like standing in fog. Mm. You can't pick anything out because there isn't anything to see, but you can sort of see through it. The other thing is you don't really know how far you can see through it because it's very different, difficult to judge distance if you don't have a focal point. Mm. Now, if you are in fog and you see an object, that object really jumps out on you. Let's now have a look at zig rigs in particular. So zigs underwater, when you look laterally, a black one stands out really, really well because it's got a very, very defined edge. And also mm-hmm. fish having polarising filters in their eyes, they can pick them out really well. So that's one of the reasons why black is so good. Anybody that saw some of the underwater fox films that I did with with Harry, um, mm-hmm. you, you might remember the zig one from last year, that we, we looked at algae in water. Now, as soon as you put algae in water, Actually, it changes through the spectrum. At the top, it's very yellow. As it goes a little bit deeper, it goes a a lighter green, then a darker green, and eventually it gets down to brown, particularly if it's dying off. So you can have different layers of colour through the water. Very, very bright at the top. Brown, three-quarters of the way down. Underneath that, it could be clear because there's no algae there. It's just clear water Mm -hmm. that you can see through. So this is where if you put a yellow zig out, you can't see it. If you put a black one out, you can see it. Red really jumps out as well because there's nothing underwater that's red. Mm. In addition to that, if you think the majority of the the, the, the colour underwater is like at the yellowy green end of the spectrum because weed is green, our light is yellowy. Uh, when it's diffused through algae and water, which is greeny yellow, it, the whole area turns greeny yellow. Mm. So if you want something to stand out, you've got to go the opposite end of the colour spectrum to do that. And that would be ready pink. And there's no 
coincidence that red and pink are such good baits because they're the opposite end of the colour spectrum to the majority of water that we see. Mm. In addition to that, they're actually the opposite end of the spectrum to the bottom because a lot of people think silt is black, but it's actually not. It's the dead stuff underneath that's that's black. The anaerobic silt is black. The silt that's on the top that still has some air in it is actually the same colour as the local stone. So mm. if you're in the Cotswolds, for example, Oxford, um, Cotswold Water Park, all of that, the bottom of the lake is going to be Cotswold stone yellow. So it's almost like a mustard yellow. Uh, if you go to the clay pits of North London, uh, that's a slightly deeper yellow. If you go over to Essex, and I always have a bit of a snigger about this one, it's actually slightly more orange. Uh, <laughs> if you if you go up the there's a, there's a clay seam around Birmingham, a gravel and clay seam around Birmingham that runs um, almost up to Derbyshire before it goes back into the mountains, and it runs just down to Warwickshire. And that seam there, again, that's that's orangey clay with gravel in it as well. So if you have a look at the colour of the local stone, you'll know more or less what the bottom of the lake is like. And it's it's really useful, firstly, for camouflaging your rigs down, but secondly, thinking about what colour baits you should use to make it stand out more on the bottom. Uh, and, and pink for me is a winner because there isn't anything underwater that's pink. So this is where you get that um, carp behavioural, associated behaviour or the inquisitiveness of it. They see it and they think, oh, that's a bit different, or it really, really stands out. Now, in clear water, fish will sight feed as well as scent feed. In mm. dirty water, they'll scent feed primarily and sight feed when they get close to it because they can't see through solid matter. Um, mm. But if you use a colour that really, really stands out, then you can draw the eye to it. If you Yellow is a really, really weird colour because if you're using a standard yellow boilie, and I mean not high vis, but just a bog standard yellow boilie, it's actually quite camouflaged underwater out in our hand it looks really good and we think we're using it because it's a high vis bright this is going to be a great standout bait actually it's really camoed because everything underwater is a similar color to it it's the pink ones that work because they are high vis or not high vis um high visibility and i'll I'll, i'm careful about my choice of words there because high vis pop-ups as far as we're concerned are actually flora pop-ups and they work in a different way to a non-flora they might be yellow but they grab more light because they've got fluorescing and fluorescence in them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, yeah, the, the color choice is to, to me is massive. And you know, you, you speak to lure anglers, speak to trout anglers, speak to all sorts of other anglers. Have a think about it yourselves. How often have you had a yellow one on, not caught, and you've chucked a pink one out and you've caught straight away? It's not mm-hmm. that the fish weren't there; they were there. They just didn't want whatever it was that, that all, alternatively couldn't see it. You know, they're key, key things. And the, the, my, my ultimate argument for the people that turn around and say, well, fish can't see in colour. Colour makes no difference to them whatsoever. I'll just ask them to have a look at a perch, which is a predator, and ask them why, if roach can't see perch, why has the perch got green and black stripes on it to make it look like a reed bed? And why is it camouflaged in the way that it is to hide it? And... For those that disagree with that, let's now have a look at the roach, which is going to get eaten by the perch. And why, when you look at a roach from above, does it look like the bottom? And when you look at the roach from underneath, it's really, really bright, so it looks like the top. Hmm. Why has nature evolved roach and perch so that one can disguise itself so it can't be eaten and the other can disguise itself so it can jump out and eat something? Because for me, ultimately, nature has the answer evolution mm-hmm. over those years has has put those creatures into the best position they can possibly be and if fish can't see color they could be red orange pink with blue spots whatever it is the only reason goldfish are the color they are is because we've genetically manipulated them yeah. that's it the only colorful fish that you actually get are fishing coral areas and would you believe it they're colorful because the land and the surroundings around them is colorful so you know that's 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 my ultimate argument to anybody that says fish can't see in colour or their eyesight's crap. Yeah, brilliant. I think there's almost we could almost do a whole episode just on that. By the sounds of it. Yeah, oh, I've, I've got so many things I could talk about with that as well. I've had so many yeah. findings. My like, you know, I've spent the thick end of twenty five years <laughs> swimming with, chasing or being chased by carp. <laughs> So you know the the behavioural patterns of some of them they're amazing when you when you see the differences, um, you know, and, and the way that juvenile fish behave in comparison with some of the older fish, and also what what's what's really weird, um, although actually it's the same in human behaviour as well. But you can have year classes of fish that behave in a certain way, but you can also have size classes of fish 
that behave in the same way. And you think, well, actually, they must be the same age, they're the same size, but that's not necessarily the case at all. Because as we all know, you know, you can have a 20 pounder that's mm. six years old, or you can have a 20 pounder that's 30 years old. Mm. So size classes tend to behave obviously the age and the maturity and the experience levels change a little bit with them but but where you see certain size classes and i've seen it no end of times that fish between 17 and 21 22 pounds those upper double low 20 fish hmm. they've just got this really scatty behavior <laughs> and and you know they, they might be five-year-old in one pond and they might be 10 year old in another pond but they sort of hmm. behave in the same way but anyway, like you say, story for another time. Yeah, no, definitely. Thank you, mate. Um, all right, if we wrap up there, just one uh, one more thing. I'm getting every guest in the lockdown to do, just as a bit of fun, a 60-second sketch of a carp and video it and then ping it over to me and I'm going to do like a little fun competition at the end of lockdown, whatever that what, may be. What, I've got to be. draw one? Yeah, 60 seconds, oh, video it. Life. I'll tell you what, it's wow. Get Jack to do it as well and he can enter the competition as well so you can have two entries and we'll come up with some sort of fun prize. Um, right, okay, but just video on. each other's, and then when you get a moment, just ping it over. Okay, okay. You know when you're Brilliant. absolutely crap at something. Yeah. Guess what? I'm absolutely crap at. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, um, I've said it several drawing. times. The, yeah. the bar is very low, so don't worry. Get, get Frank Morrick on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Guy. Frank is going to come on. Actually, I messaged him the other day. Frank's one. Yeah. Yeah, so. well, Ed Skills is doing it. There's been a few tattoo artists, so they've come on. So, yeah. Um, okay, mate, brilliant. Right, Excellent. we'll wrap up there. Right. Rob, thank you very yeah, much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me. Okay, take care. Cheers. You too. Bye-bye.